And when was the last time that you took care of your mind? Instead, we take care of our outer. We take care of our bodies. We take care of the way we look. We take care of our homes. We, you know, we're constantly cleaning, tidying, caring for the external. But when was the last time we cared for the mind where it all begins? Thank you for tuning in to season three of the Real Women Shine podcast sponsored by Beach Candy Swimwear. This year, we are celebrating 11 years in the making. What began as a local swim shop in coastal California in 2011 to today, a globally recognized brand collected by women around the world. As seen on E! News, The Real Housewives of Orange County, Good Day LA, and also named Editor's Pick in Sports Illustrated. My name is Britt. I am the founder, pattern maker, and designer at Beach Candy Swimwear. I will be your host, recording raw, real conversations with women who have an extraordinary story to tell. This season, we would like to introduce our Wellness for Women initiative, sharing holistic healing practices from my personal journey of reversing autoimmune disease. At Beach Candy Swimwear, we believe in the infinite alchemy of women empowering women. Find inspiration to enrich your life as we spotlight real, everyday women who shine. With depression, anxiety, and mental health on the rise, today we have with us Monique Rhodes, whose mission in life is to lead you towards a lifetime of happiness and making happiness a habit. To accomplish that, she combines powerful teachings with habit-changing exercises. Hi, Monique. How are you? Britt, it's so nice to be here with you. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you on here. And I know you're in New Zealand. Is that right? I came here. I came back home during the pandemic. I did nine months of solid lockdown in LA and decided best to go home for a little bit where there was no COVID for so long. So I'm here for a little bit more and then I'm heading back. Okay. And is Dallas your home base in America or where are you? Usually Los Angeles, but actually I'm moving to Costa Rica. I've decided that, you know, my team are all in the States and I've spent the last uh, year working with them remotely. So I'm heading to a gorgeous part of the world uh, because I'm able to. Amazing. Absolutely. Now, where in Costa Rica are you heading? I'm planning to live on the Guanacaste coast, which is one of the blue zones. So the blue zones are these places in the world. There's five of them where people live with optimal health and they have the highest number of people who are living to 100. And I've always wanted to live in one. And the Nicoya coast is the place where it is. So I've decided that's where I'm going to go and live there for a year and see if it's it's my jam. And if it is, then we'll set up shop there. I love that. That's so inspiring to me. Oh, my goodness. So tell our listeners, I know they're uh, fresh to your name. So let us know a little bit about your life's work and what you're up to. Sure, Britt. So look, basically, I grew up in one of the most magnificent countries in the world. Um, New Zealand. It's it's an amazing country. I know many of you will have heard of it. We're well known for our the greatest sporting team in the world, the All Blacks. Uh, our Prime Minister, I know, has become very well known, but also the scenery and the country. It's just a really wonderful country. If you've seen Lord of the Rings, that was uh, filmed there. I know a lot of people know it from there, and many of you will have visited. So New Zealand's a wonderful country, and uh, I'm I'm so grateful that I grew up here but I also suffered a lot and probably by the age of reaching a teenager I I think it would be fair to say that I was depressed suffering from a lot of stress and anxiety depression emotions out of control thoughts out of control really feeling there was something wrong with me and not knowing how to deal with it it's not the sort of thing you know you were taught by the time I reached the age of 19, there became a, a pivotal point where I ended up in a hospital having tried to take my own life. I think that 
despair was completely overwhelming me and I couldn't see, see a way through. And I asked myself a question at that time of like, what's wrong with me? You know, is it something that is genetic? Is it something wrong with the makeup of my brain? Why does it seem to be that other people seem to cope with life and I'm, I'm really struggling with it? I wanted to answer that question. I wanted to figure out, you know, was it movable? Were, were my happiness levels movable? And that led me on a journey that is, I think, will last till the rest of my life. But I traveled all over the world for 13 years. I lived out of a bag. I did wild things like rode a motorbike through India for four years, um, looking at different cultures, ways of being, philosophies to see if I could shift this in myself. And the great news is that not only did I shift it, but shifted my happiness levels to a place where I didn't even know was possible. You know, I didn't know it was possible to have, you know, 90% of the time to be in a really, really happy place. It doesn't mean that there aren't difficulties that happen. Of course they do. But shifting this has been my life's work. And now, rather than everyone go through the slog that I had to go through to figure it out and discover it, I now teach people how to do the same. Tell me more about how this led you to where you are today. Well, actually, the first place that created a realization for me was when I went to Thailand. So it was one of the first countries I traveled to. And I remember being in Thailand and going down this canal uh, on a boat. And I remember seeing on a on a this on this bank there was this man and he was he was sitting in what was clearly his house which was four bamboo poles and a tarpaulin and next to him were a few belongings and i remember looking at him and seeing a joy in in him on his face that was clearly so deep and i was thrown how could someone in a third world country like this be so incredibly happy? Because I've been led to believe that all of the things that we chase in the West literally are going to bring us happiness because that's what we're doing. Whether we're busy, whether we're a mother, whether we're working, whether you know we're trying to get more money or be more successful, all of these things, we're literally just trying to be happier. Mm -hmm. Yet he was this man who had none of those things right. and was possibly one of the happiest people I'd ever seen in my life. So that then, you know, created a question for me, Britt, of, okay, wait a second, <laughs> something is wrong here and everything I've been led to believe will lead me to happiness. So that was the first thing was really starting to try and understand what was the source of it? And I saw a lot of this in India as well. You know, I saw, you know, a lot of people who were incredibly poor and, and I don't want to belittle the fact that poverty can be extremely painful, but I saw huge amounts of happiness and it began to make me reflect on the physical poverty of a third world country versus the psychological poverty of the West. And if we even look at the situation now, Britt, there's, you know, life is pretty difficult in the West and the, you know, the, the stress and anxiety and depression levels are going through the roof. Right. You know, before the pandemic, the World Health Organization said that um, depression was going to overtake obesity as the number one uh, health problem in the world. And I would probably guess that that's already happened. They said it was going to happen by 2030. I, I imagine we might already be there. Yes. So it's really important for us to take stock and start to look at, okay, if this is happening for us and we've got all of the things that make us comfortable, right. why is it that we're not, you know, we're not happy when we have all of the tools and technology and things to kind of make life easier, yet life seems to be becoming more difficult? And it's an important question for us to ask. Absolutely. I did just read that, that we have, 
you know, the conveniences are at an all time high. We can have food delivered to our door. We have television and depression and anxiety is at an all time high. So you're absolutely right. Everyone is, uh, seems to be on the wrong track here. And so now how do you start to debunk that? How do you start to take someone who is unaware of, of how to, uh, use meditation or use um, breath work or things to really come back to a place of stillness and peace. How do you, I know you're very well practiced in meditation, but how do you teach that to someone? Yeah, great question, Brett. I think the first thing to ask ourselves is why am I doing it? Why do I do breath work? Why do I do meditation? Like, what's it about? What's the benefit? When we start to see what the benefit is in something, our motivation levels rise dramatically because if we don't understand the why, it becomes difficult. So I think that this is one of the first things we have to look at because when we look at all of these people with so much, you know, all of these comforts and technology and like you say, food being able to deliver, why is it that we're not happy? Why is it that a documentary was done probably about 10 years ago in, um, by this couple of Australian guys that went all over the world looking for the happiest community in the world? Where did they find it? In a slum in Mumbai. Why is that? Well, I think the first thing we have to understand is that happiness and suffering don't come from outside of ourselves. Right. They come from inside of ourselves. So we look at, and we can know this, if we look at, you know, all of the people in the world that have all the things that we're led to believe will make us happy. Let's, let's list off the obvious ones, fame, money, uh, power, um, beauty, talent. I, I remember a few years ago going to, going to Las Vegas and seeing Lady Gaga perform. God, she was amazing. She's so amazing. She really is extraordinary. And I was struck that she had all of those things. She was getting paid $1 million a show. She's beautiful. She's super talented. She's not only got Grammy, she's got Academy Awards. She's powerful. And yet one of the things that she did was speak about the, the sadness inside of her. Why does someone with all of those things feel so miserable? Why are there so many celebrities that we see that are not only addicts, take their own lives? You know, there's so many public displays of this. So we then have have to start to question, if we believe that all of those things bring us happiness, why do so many of the people that have it, why are they not happy? Right. Because happiness and suffering doesn't come from outside of ourselves. It comes from in our mind. And when was the last time that you took care of your mind? Instead, we take care of our outer. We take care of our bodies. We take care of the way we look. We take care of our homes. We, you know, we're constantly cleaning, tidying, caring for the external. But when was the last time we cared for the mind, where it all begins. So that's one of the most important things for us to understand, Britt, is that as we constantly chase looking for that thing that's going to make everything okay, we already have it. It's right here. And we need to turn the focus to here rather than out there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And it's also, it's not just mindset. It's like really caring for the mind. What do I put in the mind? What do I put in my mind? Mindset sometimes feels like, well, I'm going to think about things in a particular way, but what are we actually sticking in our mind? I often think of the mind as like this kind of room. It's this room. It's so precious. And yet It's like we have all of the doors and the windows open and we let anybody and everything come in. Right. 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 And then it gets filled with like all of this dirt and debris and people are walking through it. And and then we wonder, why doesn't it feel so good in there? 
because we don't take care of it. We don't clean it and we don't protect it. Right. We go online. We look at all sorts of stuff. We watch TV shows that are filled with violence, that make us anxious, that make us fearful. We, uh, you know, go on to social media and we, you know, are filled with stuff that has absolutely no relevance to us in our lives. We watch news cycles that show us all of the shadow side of our world. And all of that is coming into this room of our mind. We're not thoughtful about the people we spend time with. We let people kind of waltz in and out of our mindset and fill us with their opinions. You know, we live in such an opinionated world right now. Everybody's got an opinion. Right. And then we get ourselves into this bubble of opinions that is usually just um, re-emphasizing uh, our fearful mindset. And then we wonder, Brett, why we're suffering from stress, anxiety, and depression. If I were to take you right now and, you know, you, you're in this beautiful space, this beautiful room. If I was to take you right now into a... Uh, a, a, a really horrible room. It's concrete. It's cold. There's water seeping through. And I, you know, left you there with a whole bunch of people telling you things that weren't relevant to your life and were anxiety filling. And I left you there for a week. How, how are you going to be when I pull you out? Right. I don't think you're going to feel very good. Right. But that's the cultural norm we're living in now. Right. We're living in a cultural norm that says, hey, I'm going to stick you in that room. I'm going to make it look fancy so you don't actually quite realize where you are. And then I'm going to not only leave you there for a week, but I'm going to leave you there year after year. But because everybody does it, on some level, we think it's okay. And we're not seeing what's happening to us, except we see these statistics of stress, anxiety, and depression going through the roof. And we're like, please do not let me be a victim of that. Please do not let me become a statistic. And slowly, one by one, people are. And we wonder why. Because we don't understand that our society is set up in a way that is working against us right now. So we have to be pretty courageous to say, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't be part of the world in the way that it's presenting anymore. If everybody is doing this and everybody's going to, down this path, I can see it's not working. So I have to start to ask myself, how can I do things differently so that I can have a different result? Because if I keep doing what everyone is doing, I'm only going to end up with the same result that they're getting. Now, how do you uh, begin to live free of all the stresses of our modern day world while still being in it and not moving away to paradise or to a blue zone in Costa Rica and, and, and redefining your whole life? How do you stay in the same place and live with all of the family and friends that you know, with the TV on and with all of these distractions and all of these things that you can't help but bump into, how do you protect your mind as you go through modern day life? Yeah, it's a great question. If you were, if I was to present you, Britt, with a newborn baby, and said, this is your newborn baby, you would do everything to keep it safe and protect it. Correct. Why do we not do that with ourselves? I don't know. <laughs> right? One of the most important things is to start to become aware. All right, a meditation practice is so great, and we'll come to that, but there's a deeper awareness that we need to look at, which is why do we treat ourselves like this? Why are we so unkind to ourselves? Why would we treat a newborn baby with absolute care and 
respect and honor or our best friend, and yet we don't do that for ourselves. One of the most powerful things we can do is to start to become aware of what what has an effect on me. Most of us don't know. Most of us are not friends with ourselves, so we don't actually know. We might start to just experiment with ourselves. Okay, I'm going to look at how I feel after half an hour on social media. Like, how do I feel? Do I even know what my feelings are? Do I even know how to be in touch with them? Get a feelings chart. Start to look. Start to identify how do you feel. It's a little bit like, you know, when you eat a piece of cake and the first bite is so good, right? Right. And then the fourth or fifth, it doesn't feel good. And by the time you're done, you're like, why did I do that to myself? There's a whole lot of things that we do that the first bite feels so good on, but by the time we're down the track, it doesn't feel so good. So start to identify, does half an hour on social media feel really good? Does an hour? What about five minutes? What if I was to give myself five minutes and set an alarm and then with the rest of that half an hour, go and take a walk somewhere outside and listen to a really inspiring podcast or something like that? Right, right, right. Start to become aware. If I if I watch the news on TV, what does it do to me? I know for myself, I don't watch any of it, but I don't want to be ignorant. So this is what I do every morning when I've done all my practices. I sit down and I set a timer for ten minutes. That's it. And I have three news news uh, sites that I go and look at right? One's in the UK, one's in the United States, one's in New Zealand. And I go through and I look at the headlines. Every so often, there'll be something I think I need to know more about. But literally, just by reading the headlines, I am able to see what is happening. And then after 10 minutes, I shut it down and I don't look at it again for the rest of the day. I don't watch any news videos at all. Okay. Now, if you were to do this for a month, just that alone, it I'd be really interested to see how you start to feel. Because when I get my students to do it, they see an instant impact. Okay. Yeah. Be aware of, okay, if I watch a, a TV show, what what TV shows raise my anxiety? You know? What TV shows, my, if I'm watching a lot of violence, how does it make me feel? Most of us are not aware. When I'm with my friends, who is it that gives me life-filling energy? And who is it that I feel drained by? Start to become aware. doesn't mean that you have to let those people go. It just means that we start to become aware of where does the good feelings come from? And who am I within that? You know, am I someone who talks to their friends and complains all the time? Or am I someone that brings that good energy as well? And I'm not at all saying that we bypass everything with positivity. But I'm saying let's just get a little bit real here about what is affecting us. Because most of us aren't aware. What foods affect you? How does exercise affect you? How much sleep do you need? Are you aware of all of these things? Because they all play a role. And then the most important thing for us is to build a relationship with our mind. And the most, the easiest, the most powerful way to do that is through a daily meditation practice that can be short, doesn't have to be long, but consistency is the key. And through that, we begin to see What's going on with my mind? What thoughts do I have consistently? What emotions do I have consistently? And meditation teaches you that when those thoughts and emotions come that you feel uncomfortable with, you learn to stay with them rather than running away from them. Because one of the other things that people don't realize, Britt, is that one of the biggest reasons we have this problem with depression I believe, is because we're so terrified of our negative emotions. We're so afraid of them. And so what we do is we 
pick them up and we put them in a cupboard at the furthest end of our house and say, please, I do not want to know you. But something that people don't realize is that the more that we look at our positive emotions, the more they grow. And the more that we look at our negative emotions, the more they settle down. So whatever we resist persists. We need to learn how to deal with our negative emotions so that they're not chasing us, tapping on the door going, please, you need to see me. And that's what's happening for a lot of people. They run away through, you know, um, social media, looking at your phone all the time, always distracting food, whatever addictions that we have. They're really just a way to try and get away from the shadow side of us that we're so afraid of. Mm. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. I'm actually on a journey now. I uh, was recently diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and I'm learning all about pesticides, toxins, environment, cleaning it up. So I've, I've eaten no grain, dairy, soy, alcohol, or refined sugar in a year and four months. That's why you look so unbelievably healthy. So <laughs> I can see it in you. And I am working on cleaning the mind and making sure that stress um, stays away because stress, anxiety is, is absolutely uh, contributes to when I have a flare up with the disease and when I do not. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much um, along the path of what you're speaking. And I, I, I think it's a very important message and a very daunting message to deliver to the masses because it's just so uh, upstream from the norms of society. So I really commend you for, for taking, taking this awareness to the world. Very and, and you're right, it totally is swimming upstream. But if we look at where the masses are going and the crisis in the United States right now is almost gobsmacking for those of us who don't live there, like watching this schism breaking the country apart and seeing what it's like to live in it and the, the, the stress and anxiety and the fear that's coming from all sides from it is so massive. So, when, so then we have to understand that if everybody else is going down a particular path and we can see the results of it, we, we do get to make a choice. Absolutely. Am I going to end up where everyone else is ending up? Or if I'm not, there's no option but to do things differently. And what am I prepared to do differently to be happy? Because that's all, that's all we're wanting. We just want to be happy. Absolutely. But it's difficult when, when there are cultural norms that lead us in a particular um, you know, I, I remember years ago, Brett, I was, uh, when I was in India, I was right up in the Himalayas. And um, so I bought this motorbike and I, I rode this or motorcycle, as you would call it, rode this motorcycle through India. And um, I remember being up in this place, it's called Ladakh. It's right, it's so far north that you can only uh, ride in there three months of the year because it's snowed out the rest of the time. So really, really amazing. And basically I was up there and I know this is will sound a crazy thing, but uh, I, I wasn't wearing a helmet when I was up there. I was riding around the town and didn't wear a helmet. It, nobody was wearing a helmet. And I get pulled up by this policeman. And he says to me, why are you not wearing a helmet? And I know that I'm going to have to pay him and I'm getting a fine and all that. And I said to him, look, and I showed him everyone in the street. And I said, no one's wearing a helmet. Like, why are you pulling me over? And he looked at me and he said, and if they all then ride off a cliff, are you going to do the same? And it was such a profound moment. I actually hugged him and I said to him, oh, thank you. You know, I'm such a rebel. I never do what everyone else is doing. But I saw in that moment that I had fallen into this trap because no one was wearing a helmet that I wasn't wearing a helmet. It was so stupid. If I'd come off my bike, even though we weren't riding very fast, it was just in the township, you know, the implications were huge, but because everyone else was doing something, it 
becomes very easy for us to think that it's normal. That's so true. Now, if you have one more word of wisdom for our listeners, how to create happiness as a habit, what would it be? Just the knowledge that you can be in charge of your happiness. No matter what has gone on in your life, no matter what is happening in your life, no matter where your mind is, there are ways to change how you feel. And I'm not saying that from a place of, oh, life was really easy for me. I'm saying it from a place of, I turned my life around. And if it's possible for me, it's possible for you because promise me, I promise you, I'm no Einstein, but I've experimented deeply with myself and seen this, these shifts are possible. I've worked with thousands of people and it is possible, but the key, the secret is learning how to work with your mind. That's so beautiful. Now, how do our listeners find you? Website is moniqueroads.com. You can come there. I've got a bunch of courses they are amazing. We we have one course called the Happiness Baseline. Uh, we test people at the beginning their happiness levels with the Penn State University Happiness Inventory, which is the standard. We test them again at the end. I'm so proud to say that I have a 100% success rate in shifting people's happiness levels in that course from when they start to when they finish. I have a podcast, a daily podcast called In Your Right Mind. Just come and connect. I'm I. I love nothing more than helping people shift and change their lives. That is so amazing, Monique. It was so such a nice conversation with you. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank and- you for having me on, Britt. And, and stay well. And I love that what you're doing uh, with your own self is now becoming a gift to other people as well. I think that's just so beautiful. Thank you so much, Monique. Maybe our paths will cross in uh, Central America one day. I hope so. <laughs> All right, Moni. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Real Women Shine podcast with Beach Candy Swimwear. We hope this episode brightened your day and inspired you to shine your brightest. If you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button below. You can also shop and connect with us at beachcandyswimwear.com.